Hey everyone, thank you for joining me today on the Empty Cup Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Carlin. We have returning guest, Sean Madigan. How you doing, Sean? I'm doing awesome, dude. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. You're my second returning guest, so that means I must have run out of friends, right? That's exactly so I, right. <laughs> I feel like the guy on Saturday Night Live, the host that just keeps on coming back. I'm like, you're, I'm like, you're Steve Martin now. Kind of right, right. It's that, yeah, Steve, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> right on. So I've run out of friends. I got to call all my old friends up and say, hey, would you please be on the show? <laughs> no, <laughs> no I, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, so, um, you're listening to the podcast in which traditional and modern martial arts collide and we dissect what is left over. And today is absolutely no exception because we have a couple of issues that we want to talk about. Uh, and one of them is going to be this idea of can you put Jeet Kune Do, Jeet Kune Do together from studying several different arts? Uh, what are our thoughts on that? Uh, and, you know, you get the guy in there is like, well, you know, I took Taekwondo and I took uh, the kicks from Taekwondo and I did a little bit of fencing and I did this and I put it together and I call it JKD. Is that legit? Is it not legit? What's the shortcoming? And then the Bruce Lee video that's kind of circulating right now, you know, it's, sometimes it's called Bruce Lee's, you know, the only fight caught on camera with Bruce Lee. So I thought I'd bring my, uh, my resident uh, expert in JKD back on the show. I know you don't consider you. Yeah, last time I yeah. said you were an expert. Okay. <laughs> you know? I'm the furthest thing from an expert, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so only the true expert would deny his expertship. So <laughs> it's like that. Did you see uh, the life of Brian? Did you I ever did see not. that Monty? Oh, it's like only the true Messiah would deny he's the Messiah. <laughs> so, <laughs> You got to be a true expert because you deny you're an expert. <laughs> and I'm not the Messiah either, so I'll make that thing think about yeah, that one. No, no. <laughs> I didn't mean to go there, folks. No, I love my love. Um, here, here's the thing is um, uh, when you first came on the show, I was still kind of developing the format. You were one of my first guests. And with all my other guests, I like did kind of a, a little bit of a formal interview of like their background and in the martial arts and stuff like that. And I didn't do that with you. We just kind of jumped into the topic. And one of the reasons was I didn't quite format the show yet. And the other part of the reason was due to the fact that um, I, I had known you and, uh, you know, I kind of had already known your background. So I kind of skipped past that. But, you know, there's a large segment, segment of my audience who probably listen to that and go, well, why didn't Ian, uh, you know, ask him about his martial arts history? So I want to get into that a little bit today. Um, so tell me a, a little bit about, like, how old you were when you started martial arts? What was your first martial art? What led you to where you are now? That kind of thing. All right. So I got into martial arts at a very young age because I had anger issues as a kid. Um, I used to beat up my younger brother and um, do all sorts of stupid things. I was dealing with uh, my parents got separated and, you know, I was a kid. I was, I'm going to say, nine years old. And um, I had some anger issues going on. And someone had suggested to my mom that I take karate lessons to help me channel my anger. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was more just to get me tired so I'd go to sleep at night. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, she, uh, she listened to the, to the suggestion and brought me to a local uh, school, and she picked the school only because it was the closest one to the house that she could afford. And um, it was a Japanese jiu-jitsu school, and if I said that I really remembered – that much about it. I'm 50, I'm going to be 52 years old. I would be lying. Um, I remember <laughs> learning a bunch of katas and um, having to demonstrate the katas and stuff to, to get your belt and things to that effect. I remember liking the instructor and I remember it giving me a lot of confidence. I remember <laughs> me feeling like a total badass at, at nine and 10 years old because I knew quote unquote karate. And I, and I did it for a few years um, and like most kids, I, I did it until I discovered football. You know, I wanted to play football and then eventually left karate and went to football and played football for a long time. And, and then went back and then went after that, went back to Taekwondo. I think like every other kid in America. 
<clears throat> I did a Taekwondo thing yeah. in uh, in Brooklyn for three years, four years, something to that effect, you know. And I and I trained in Taekwondo, and um, my next martial experience was high school, and I joined the wrestling team, mm -hmm. and um, that was really like eye opening for me as a martial artist. Like, that's kind of like, you know, high school is when you start to grow up a little bit and you realize that everything you kind of learned maybe could have been a little wrong. And, you know, wrestling right. was wrestling was the shit, you know. Excuse my language. Wrestling was really... No, no, you can cuss. You can cuss on this program. I put okay. Um, you know, wrestling really was an eye-opener for me, you know. It was, um, it was just a, an athletic endeavor revol revolving around combat that really just put all the truth out there, you know, your truth's on the mat. And mm -hmm. um, it kind of also became my litmus, litmus test for everything I did going forward. And it doesn't mean I've never done anything that uh, that would be considered less than um, perfect for the street. I have done things that are for the pure sake of tradition and, mm -hmm. and self-development. Um, but I always kind of could tell what was bullshit and what wasn't just because of my wrestling background. I think it gave me an eye for it. But um, it gave you a good, a good base of resistance, of understanding resistance. Yeah, right. Exactly right. You know, um, it, it really, it really set this baseline for me. Is okay. This is what progressive resistance should really feel like. Mm -hmm. um, when I was an adult, I, uh, I, you know, I went to Taekwondo. I went back to Taekwondo for a while. You know. Back leave, back leave, that kind of thing. I'm not going to lie and say I was this awesome martial artist my whole life. Um, right. I'm not an awesome one now. Uh, but I did this kind of like back and forth thing with Taekwondo, on and off, on and off, on and off. And when I got married, I, you know, I, um, I, uh, I, you know, I did some kung fu too as a, as a kid, thrown in there. But uh, when I got married, I told my wife that I always wanted to do Jeet Kune Do. And um, so I found a Jeet Kune Do school about an hour away from my house. I went and uh -huh. I signed up. And um, I went there for a few years, and I, I learned a lot of stuff. But it was through that, that uh, through that school that I um, met my friend, Steve Golden, my teacher mm -hmm. in Jeet Kune Do. I, 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 he was not in school. He actually... Um, who was a Bruce Lee student? He trained with yes. Bruce Lee in the Chinatown School. Very knowledgeable was, guy. Your your oh, episode of Kids of Kung Fu with Steve Golden is one of my favorite episodes. I'm happy to hear that. He he is an incredibly knowledgeable guy. He um has an analytical brain and he's incredibly kind as well. So I've learned a lot from Steve Golden over the last twenty odd years, and um. But even within that, I still like always progressed in my head or tried to follow my interest in the martial arts. So while training with Steve, I, I've never left training with Steve, but while training with Steve, I, I've done two other things that were beneficial to me. Um, at some point, I became really interested in, um, in, getting, in getting in touch with my grappling roots and, uh, and, and, and learning... Um, an MMA type environment kind of situation. And I contacted uh, Matt Thornton who mm -hmm. runs uh, straight blast gyms mm -hmm. and um, another really, really smart dude um, who loves it. You know, he says shit that's going to piss you off, but dude's a good, he's a smart man and he's, he's, yeah. not, he's a nice guy. And um, so I started working with Matt Thornton. I ended up uh, running a um, training group gym kind of thing on the Straight Blast Gyms umbrella for a little while, which was basically, um, in my mind, one of the most complete progressive mixed martial arts programs I have ever experienced. Um, he uh, deals with uh, stand-up, clenching ground, mm -hmm. and I learned a lot. And it was funny because one, one of the best things I, I – uh, one of the best things to come from that, aside from my uh, relationship that I still have to this day with Matt Thornton and the training that I still retain from learning from Matt Thornton, was um, 
I had hosted Matt Thornton for a seminar in Brooklyn. And uh, so people were signing up for the seminar and, you know, coming to train and sign up for the gym even before taking the seminar. And, and uh, so one gentleman that came down, and he signed up and, and um, – I, you know, I asked him, remember, I say to him, do you have any martial arts experience? And he just says, a little. So I'm like, okay, you know. So we go to the seminar, and I remember that in the, after the first night of the seminar, I had a habit of Googling, or I don't know if at the time it was like Alta Vista or whatever the, whatever the <laughs> search engine was of the day. Right. I remember I said, like, because I teach out of my house, that I would Google search people's names that were training with me just to make sure who I have in my house here, you know, in front of my, yeah. around my wife and kids. So I, um, I Googled this gentleman's name and he said, and it came up that he, um, was giving the eulogy at the Grandmaster Moyat's funeral. Oh. And I knew he said to me two days prior that he had a little martial arts training. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm saying, okay, he's got a little martial arts training and he's, now the website says he's a disciple of Grandmaster Moyad who gave the eulogy at his funeral. We have right. to work something out here. Right, so, right. So that, that, that Sunday on the seminar, I, I said to him, I says, uh, hey, you know, let's have lunch together. Mm -hmm. So he's like, sure. So I remember we, um, when we broke for lunch, we went down, we got a couple slices of pizza, which was really smart to do on, on an MMA seminar. I'm sure that came up later. And um, <laughs> we're sitting in the car, and I said, uh, Tom, I says, you told me you had a little martial arts experience. He says, yeah, I do. I said, well, according to online, you're a disciple of Grandmaster Moyad. He says, yes, I am. I'm like, maybe you have a little bit more than a little? And he's like, yeah, maybe a little bit, you know. So, right. well, so he had signed up for our MMA gym, and uh, he was training with me. And then what was cool was I always had a, uh, a love of Wing Chun, and I did Wing Chun – a small amount of Wing Chun as, as, as a youngster, but nothing nothing I retained as an adult other than, you know, some nonsense. And, of course, because of my JKD training, I had a uh, wooden man, a Mukyang Jong, in my basement. Mm -hmm. So when – after we would have our MMA training, you know, I'd have eight, ten guys in my basement rolling around, working guard and things to that effect – when the night was over, everybody would leave, except for my friend and student, Tom. And I would ask him questions about Grandmaster Moyat and about Wing Chun. And, and he started showing me this, that, and the other thing about Wing Chun and uh, some amazing stories about Grandmaster Moyat. Eventually, uh, while he was training in my gym as an MMA guy, I became his student in Wing Chun. Wow. <laughs> And wow. we, uh, and you know, and we were great, became great friends. And, uh, and I'm so honored to call him my teacher, uh, my Sifu. And, and I started developing this uh, really good, un oh, I shouldn't say good understanding. I started developing a better understanding of Wing Chun uh -huh. as, um, as it was passed on to me by my Sifu. And, uh, and I fell in love with it. And, when, and it's important to say, and, and again, I hope I'm not babbling too much here, but um, it's important to say that I fell in love with Wing Chun because people from the MMA community, they, they love to shit all over Wing Chun, and that's fine. They're welcome to shit all over whatever they like. Yeah. But, you know, there's some – I do consider Wing Chun a, an effective martial art. I do. Yeah. But yeah. more importantly than that, it's something I fell in love with. So yeah. I don't care if it's in a. It, I don't care if it's the most effective way of doing self defense. Right, right. I fell in love with it. Right. So I don't care if people say, "Wow, yeah, you're going to carry a nine foot pole with you." Right. I get it. Wing Chun uses a long pole, you know. Mm -hmm. And no, I don't carry a a a, 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 a guan with me in, in the car, but. Um, it's part of my system that I love, and that's mm -hmm. why I do it. And well, I do I think, like I, think analogy, I like the analogy you gave. It's just like, you know, why do you play acoustic guitar? You like it. You know what I mean? It's exactly Art, right. You, it's, you like acoustic guitar, so you play acoustic guitar. So just right. leave me alone. If I want to practice Wing Chun, I practice Wing Chun. I, I, spot on. We, 
Shad and I were talking about this the other day, and uh, we were saying that uh, that uh, we are sad because people underestimate the effectiveness of like chi a, a training drill like chi sao. And it's really sad because you can get somebody who's a, a good MMA fighter, you know, good boxer, good kickboxer, and chi sao can be beneficial. It can add something to it. And people underestimate its, its effectiveness. And sadly, the reason why people have underestimated its effectiveness is, in my opinion, is there have been too many people who have over not yourself but too many people who have overestimated its effectiveness and not seen it as just a tool you know what i mean i so, yeah, agree there's, more that's a there's, very good very good point yeah there's a group of people out there who think that chi sao is the measure of a fight right i'm like no it is a tool to help you to fight it's right, not exactly the measure right. of a fight and if you understand it in that respect then Wing Chun is phenomenal as far as building your 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 arsenal, but you had this group of people who overestimated. Oh, I'm going to chi sao, so I should be able to go and fight with this kickboxer. And then you know you you and I have both watched the YouTube videos, Wing Chun versus uh, right. you know whatever, and you got to go pretty damn far down the list before you find a, a Wing Chun guy who wins, right? Right, right, exactly right. <laughs> Right, right. I'm not saying they all lose because there are some of them who do win. But when they win, they are they're not sitting there anticipating chi sao. You know, they're not. They jump right. in. The guy. They, so many people in Wing Chun confuse chi sao with sparring. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Well, you see, you had a you kind of have a similar experience as I do. You went from JKD into Wing Chun. Correct. I did too. I went from JKD into Wing Chun. That was partly because of the small town I was in. My JKD instructor had moved, and a Wing Chun instructor kind of came in. And the reason why I went into Wing Chun is, was, well, well, first off, I was, uh, I was attracted to the aspect of of Wing Chun in JKD while I was learning JKD. I was, I was kind of attracted to that in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I kind of was like. I kind of wanted to look under the hood of JKD almost. You know what I mean? Sure. I, I was kind of like, like, okay, let's, Bruce Lee did this art that I learned. Now I want to learn what he learned. You know what I mean? That's sure. kind of what was my motivation. I, I had the same thing. I, I fell in love with Wing Chun. And even though there are times when I, when I kind of, people would say bash Wing Chun or, you know, I tie the video like why I left Wing Chun. People don't understand. I still practice Wing Chun. I still love Wing Chun. I still touch hands with people. I still chi sao with my friends. I still work on the dummy. You know, I still do all, I still do my forms. I still very much love, love Wing Chun. So yeah, a lot of people don't understand that, but I understand you when you're saying I, you love Wing Chun. I love Wing Chun too. I absolutely I love it, you know, and I, and I don't think you need to go from JKD to Wing Chun to make it effective. I mean, if you look at um, Anthony Iglesias up in Syracuse, Syracuse, New York, I mean, he's all over Facebook. You can't be on Facebook and be a martial artist and not know Anthony. Anthony's a badass. I mean, he, Wing Chun, he's Wing Chun true, through and true. He, I mean, yeah, he has some JKD uh, experience. I mean, he's trained with Guru Dan a bunch of times. and But he's a Wing Chun man. And, and, and Anthony's yeah. a badass. And he, you know, he'll, he'll get up and throw leather with anybody. And, and, and he is 100% straight up a Wing Chun guy. So it's it really, it's all, it's all about the... You know, it's all about the training methodology. You know, everybody says, oh, it's about the man, not the art. And that's true, but it's more about the training methodology than it is the art. Right. You know, it's it's how you train. You know, if you can, if you, you can train in Wing Chun and have a realistic look at training and combat, you're going to be an effective fighter. You know, if you, if you have a progressive, progressively re resistance training where you have sparring, we have guys throwing leather at your head and, and you, you know, you have to learn how to deal with that or get punched. You will get better. Yeah. You know? Right. And, exactly. And, and I, and I think, I, I think that's missing from a lot of schools. But, right. Uh, right. You know, so that kind of brings us to, to one of the topics I wanted to talk sure. about today because um, I, I kind of have one because you posted on big uh, in your in, in big JKD uh, a, a question was can you um, 
come up with JKD on your own through studying various arts. Uh, I mean, basically, that's that's kind of what you said. So if you want to reiterate the question, I don't go ahead and reiterate it. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I, I remember something to the fact of like, you know, can you combine arts and call what you do Jeet Kune Do? Um, right. You know, could you sit there and you're in your basement and you uh, – and, and I understand why people feel the way they do, and I, I and I really put the kind of the question out there to generate conversation, to generate conversation, yeah. and get people talking, and hopefully not not that you're ever going to settle anything, but maybe if we can find a commonality and take this commonality and work with it, you know, people can become better at, at what they're doing, have or at least have a greater understanding of what they're doing. Right. Now, I, I want to stay. I want to say first off that. I'm not the JKD police. I don't care right. who calls themselves G Kundo or doesn't call themselves G Kundo. I couldn't care less one way or another. I'm not the JKD police. I don't look at it as my job to defend Bruce Lee or G Kundo. But I do kind of care about beginners, even if I don't know them or they know me. I care about people coming into the art. And when I, and what I say by that is I, def I want – people that do JKD to say they do JKD so that newbies can find people that are legit to train with. And right. I don't want people that don't do, I want people that don't do Jeet Kune Do and call it Jeet Kune Do to stop because it's not fair to newbies coming into the art mm -hmm. that they're, they're now learning some concoction that you came up with in your basement and hitting your mommy's freaking heavy bag thinking that, you know, they're learning what Bruce Lee taught in 1967. And, and it's just wrong, or even the concepts or principles of what Bruce Lee taught in 1967. Right. You're not. You're, you're, you're lying to yourself, and that's fine. You can lie to yourself for the rest of your days. It's when you lie to other people that you tend to piss me off a little bit. Right. Well, people who lie to themselves generally tend to lie to other people because they're, right. they're self-deluded. Sure. So um, I, I feel like I, I kind of have a perspective on this and I wanted to, to run it by you. Sure. And to see, and to see what you, what you think of this perspective, because I am, you know, I, I call myself Ronan JKD for a very specific reason. Uh, and I kind of have one foot in this world and one foot out of this world. I did get legitimate JKD training for about two years. Um, and my, you know, I've got my lineage. I've been able to contact other people who knew my teacher's teacher uh, back in the 90s and, and all the way back to Steve Johnson to Bruce Lee. Um, so I, I did get my, my, lineage, my lineage verified. Um, but there, there was, so, so like I came into Jeet Kune Do from the White Dragon Martial Arts System, which was basically Tong Sado, Five Animal Forms, Aikido. Uh, kind of thrown together. Uh, so when I met my JKD instructor, he did not spend a lot of time on kicks with me. He didn't because he saw that I already knew my kicks. You know, I could already hold, you know, do a round kick, hook kick to round kick, you know, that all that kind of stuff. A little bit of a little bit on the low kicks uh, because those those were still kind of more of a came, you know, Bruce Lee's low kicks were kind of a little bit more still of the traditional martial arts or traditional Chinese uh, style. So a little bit there, but as far as this, the high kicks, it wasn't concerned. So we spent a lot of time trapping, a lot of time sparring, a lot of time uh, doing stuff that I wasn't familiar with. And if you know my story, a lot of people know my story. The, the first time I met the guy, like he didn't want to, he didn't want to train. He didn't want to train. As a matter of fact, I thought he was full of shit because he said he was a JKD instructor. And then like he would not, he kept on not showing up just to class. And I just thought, well, he's full of shit. Um, but then one day he did, and I was already a black belt, and he beat the living crap out of me, like, like bad, like bad. Right. And I was, I was just like, okay, I got to learn what he, you know, he was doing the two hands at once, and you know, coming in, and I mean, he was just the angles were amazing. So what 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 happened over the over two year period was, he didn't want to train. I think was for some religious reasons. What happened was, is like, I would like track him down. He would show me some stuff and then I would take it back to a training, my training group and we would practice what he would show. And I was, I was a pretty physical guy and I, and I was pretty coordinated. So like I could kind of pick up things quickly. 
Um, so then I would track him down again a few weeks later. He'd show me some new stuff. And then, you know, this kind of went on for about a year and a half. And then like about six months before the guy left, he, like, he showed up at my door. He knocked on my door. He said, look, I'm tired of being a carpenter. I want to open a school. I want to train every day. And for about six months, he came over and we trained for like two to three hours a night for six months. And then he disappeared. Uh, and I've seen him two other times since then. He came back to town a couple times. And then I was back in the Wing Chun, but I felt very kind of cut off. Right. And he was always like, okay, we're going to get you ready. We're going to get you down to, you know, meet Abel Sandoval, my teacher. We're going to get you ready and all this stuff. And, and then he just, just left. Well, then, then at the, when, that, when he left, Ron Heinberger came into town about six months after that. So I started studying Wing Chun. So I still always had this idea of JKD in my head. And so I was doing, so number one, I, I did have a legitimate experience in, in JKD for, you know, for a while. But at the same time, my, my training in JKD as an art was cut short. And I have tried to do my best to kind of recreate what I thought JKD was. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, now, uh, in the end, my legitimacy is in my practice. Okay, so I don't have a problem sparring with anybody, chi sound with anybody. They want to touch gloves with me. That's fine. I've got videos of me sparring up on. So I'm kind of like a yes and no when it comes to this question. Do you know what I mean? Just because of my own perspective from where I'm at. Well, absolutely. The problem is that it really is a gray area. I mean, it's, you know... But I understand yeah. what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think I, here's 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 the issue that I struggle with. If somebody just didn't have any martial arts background at all, and they just right. went and took Taekwondo and took Wing Chun and all this stuff, they might be a legitimate martial artist, but it would be very difficult for them to say it's JKD. Right, because it wouldn't be Kendo. No, no. But the question is, is what about somebody, see, so we live in an era, and this is something I wanted to run by you. We live in an era where you can, I mean, you can look at, at you, you know, you can look at any major legitimate JKD instructor, and they all have training videos on JKD, you know, right. like A to Z. You can mm -hmm. get that for free. Sure. So could somebody come close at least to saying, okay, look, I actually want to want to study JKD, and I'm going to go to this school and this school and this school and then try to refine it to what I see like Danny and Asanto doing in his academy. Because you can look at his entire curriculum online for free right. on YouTube, you know. So okay, what do you so, think about that? So you can absolutely copy the physical system of Jeet yeah. Kune If you're going to look at the um, a, a, a martial of Jeet Kune Do school's curriculum, and say, I am going to copy the physical system of Jeet Kune Do, and now say that I do Jeet Kune Do, I understand why people look at it that way. But unfortunately for them, Jeet Kune Do is not a physical system. Jeet right. Kune Do is a, system, is, a, is a system of using principles in a dynamic way is there a physical system attached to it? Well, yes or no. There's a physical system that it was taught with and should be taught with, in my opinion. But there's a, there's a series of principles used in a dynamic way that make these physical system and physical tools work. Now, I'm going to use, I'm going to use analogies here because it's sometimes I think you know it's sometimes it's best to step away from what we're speaking about passionately and put it in a different realm just because people can think about it in a different way. If let's go for guitar for a second, okay? And I'm not going to talk okay. too much about guitar, but just if if I was going to learn guitar, if I sat there and said, okay, I'm going to learn the G chord, C chord, E minor, and D. That, that, that may be like the physical tools of Jeet Kune Do, but it's not until I understand how to play them with timing, with rhythm, that I'm actually going to make some music here. Yeah, now, it, right. It's, it's, 
it's, you know, you have one's a physical, you know, this is a strumming pattern, this is a chord, and something else, it's a, and the other thing, it's a little bit more esoteric. It's rhythm, it's timing, it's knowing when to pause, it's knowing when to play the notes and when not to play the notes to, 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 to create music. Those things there are a little bit harder to copy from a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. Mostly because people don't speak about them often on YouTube videos. You know, if, we, if you're going to look at football, if you're going to say, I want to be a running back in football, can you, can you look at footage of Emmett Smith, arguably one of the best running backs to ever play the game, right? Or Barry Sanders. If you, if you look at video of them uh, practicing in, 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 um, in, in, in practices or game footage, and now impersonate what they do, mm -hmm. would you be comfortable saying, oh, I use the Barry Sanders method of running? Right. You know, no, it would be ridiculous. Right, right. And right. we're going to look at Jeet Kune Do. If you're going to say, okay, well, if, if, if Guru Dan had his whole curriculum, his Jun Fan Gung Fu curriculum on his website, I don't know if he does or not, and on it you'll see straight lead, uh, jab, cross, hook, uppercut, shovel hook, you know, Jeet Tech, Juk Tech, all the, all the texts, you know, Paksa, Lapsa, right. Bachoy, he'll have this list of things. Those are just a list of physical tools. He may even have his drills, right? Mm -hmm. He'll have the 1-3 drill, the 1-2 drill. These are all drills that Guru Dan does a lot, especially in seminars and things to that effect. You can learn some of the drills. If you don't have a teacher, either Guru Dan or someone at Guru Dan, um, mm -hmm. And trust to teach his method to explain how you put some of these lessons together. You can't fairly state, you can't truthfully state that you're doing Guru Dan's method. Right, right. You know, well, so well, if you're gonna do, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's no, no. That's a good. That's a good. And I like the. I like that analogy. It's almost like. It's almost like. Um, uh, it's almost like JKD going back to the music analogy was a song that Bruce Lee composed. That was very expressive of him. And, True. you know, you go back to the E chord, the D chord, and, you know, and the whatever, you know, uh, and, and you go, okay, well, I'm going to learn that song too. Uh, I, I <laughs> you know, you, somebody may have learned that from Bruce Lee, and then, you know, you learn that from that guy. Yeah, it, it's very hard to say, I'm going to learn this song, and I'm going to do exactly the way Bruce Lee did it. Um, that was like his own expression almost, you know what I mean? Right. And it's almost like we're on a different track. I think that, you know, uh, is this a, a, it, like somebody would be like, yeah, that's cool. You know, you, you learn that song. Why don't you create your own music? You know? Right. You, and when you, and when you learn, I mean, and when you create your own music, call it, call it yourself, call it something you call it. Right. Well, and, and that was the other thing too, in, in my particular situation, number one, I was just like, well, look, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to sit around and go, oh, I'm JKD certified. I'm not. I tell everybody I'm not JKD right. certified. I tell everybody my history, right. what, what happened. And I just said, it's, it's Roan and JKD because I was a JKD student without a master. You know, I got cut right. off right before I was going to be, and he actually came, the guy actually came back into town twice and I had been doing Wing Chun for a couple of years. And he actually wanted to learn from me. And that was kind of crazy. He was just like, oh, that's cool. He was like doing, I was showing him some, some Pac Da drills. Uh, and he was just like, boy, that'll increase your hand speed like crazy. And I was just like, yeah, it does. It really does. So it was like this, it was, it was pretty cool. I got to see him a couple of times after, afterwards. Uh, same thing though. He was just like, oh, we're going to get you down to see Abel and all this stuff. And Abel Sandoval was his instructor. Right, under right, right. Johnson. And uh, it, just again, the guy was a flake. I never saw him again. So, like, I don't have a problem telling people where I'm at because of there's two things. Number one, I don't want to lie. I mean, you know, why lie? You know, that's just stupid to lie. You'll get found out. Right. And number and number two, I have a legitimacy of my own. Right. I I am a trained martial artist. I do have you know I, I'm not afraid to get in the ring and show somebody if they have a question about it. Right. You know what I mean? So I have a legit, and, I, and that's the kind of thing that I don't care. Like if somebody says like, well, I like if they had a black belt in some other style and they said, well, I was interested in studying JKD, as long as they're not lying about it, 
and they want to call it, you know, um, um, Chinese kickboxing with JKD in it or something like that. That's fine with me. I don't care. You know, yeah, you can practice just as long as you're not saying, oh, I'm a JKD instructor, certified JKD instructor, and you're not. Right, but the problem the problem stems from Bruce Lee. The problem stems from Bruce Lee because Bruce Lee, he was a you know philosophy major. He spoke in all these philosophical terms and these philosophical statements, and you had to understand who he was speaking to at the time, the times that he was speaking in, what his audience was, and what he what point he was trying to get across at that time. And you know, and then and then there's this misunderstanding within the Jeet Kune Do, within the martial arts community, that they think that Bruce, that Jeet Kune Do is kind of like this esoteric, um, oh, take the kicks from here and the hands from here. If you combine boxing and Wing Chun and Taekwondo kicks and that you have some form of Jeet Kune Do and you just, it's just not true. You don't have some form of Jeet Kune Do. You have an incredibly effective eclectic martial art, but mm -hmm. it's not Jeet Kune Do. You know, mm -hmm. what makes Jeet Kune Do? Well, Jeet Kune Do makes Jeet Kune Do. Understanding what Jeet Kune Do, what the roots of Jeet Kune Do is, are, what the core of it is, is what makes Jeet Kune Do. You know, um, understanding distance, timing, rhythm, and, f and how they play and play with the five ways of attack. That's the yeah. core of Jeet Kune Do. Now, what you end up using to hit the guy with, what physical tool, not too many people care. As long as the physical tool you're using doesn't go against one of the principles and or concepts of Jeet Kune Do. You right, know? right, yeah. So, you like Steve Golden, who is just, it's just, you know, it's university level Jeet Kune Do in my mind, university level right. martial arts, like he'll he'll do something that will go against the principle of Jeet Kune Do and say, yeah, I wasn't using Jeet Kune Do at that particular time. He mm -hmm. he understands it to the point where he knows when he's using it when it's not. It doesn't mean what he did was wrong. It just meant that that when he did something right there, it was not Jeet Kune Do. And I don't mean that it wasn't something he learned from Bruce Lee in 1967. I mean it broke a principle of Jeet Kune Do. Jeet Kune Do mm -hmm. has principles to it. Mm -hmm. In order for you. Right. To, I believe, in order for you to say you're doing Jeet Kune Do, you have to have a lineage. And mm -hmm. you have to get the verbal traditions, the verbal understandings of the, of the principles, know why you're doing something and not just how to do it. You know, right, right. Mike Tyson probably is one of the best JKD guys out there. And he probably literally cannot spell JKD. He's so stupid, right? <laughs> so it's like... And why do I say he's one of the best JKD people out there? Because I, I may have used this on your show last time. I'm not sure. But if you're going to spar Mike Tyson, yeah, you're going to get hurt. Because right. every time Mike Tyson throws a punch at you, he's going to hit you. And every time you throw a punch at Mike Tyson, it's going to fall three inches short. He can play with distance in a yeah. way that will frustrate you beyond belief. He can break your rhythm, literally get you to trip over your own feet. In turning, mm -hmm. and and he can do all of this, and he doesn't have to claim that he does Jeet Kune Do. Well, he's employing Jeet Kune Do. You mm -hmm. know, so he can be using Jeet Kune Do unknowingly, but he, right. he doesn't, he wouldn't have the right to call it that. So just because mm -hmm. you can right. do it doesn't mean you have, you've earned the right to call what you're doing that. Now, and and you know what? And people are more than welcome to disagree with me, and that's fine. And and I and I love when people have opinions and so, say, you know what, John, I disagree with you. So but, let me let me ask you this hypothetical question. Sure. Could, do you think it's at, at all possible for somebody to um, uh, learn these independent, legitimate styles just 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 for pure sake of argument? Let's say you were you were at a seminar, you were giving a seminar, you opened it up, hey, everybody's showing up, whatever. This guy, he has at least a template because he's seen the videos of JKD curriculum online. Mm -hmm. He went and he learned the, the Taekwondo, Tonks Do kicks. He learned Wing Chun. He learned this. He learned that from legitimate sources. Put them together in a way that 
that that mimicked JKD to a great degree and then showed up at your seminar do you do you think that do you think that it's all possible that if if he didn't tell you this that you would just think that he learned from you know a, a legitimate J, JKD lineage if if i watched him move around yeah you know what maybe i i, I don't know I maybe mean, you know maybe he's a really good martial artist um yeah but it's it could be but the second he opened his mouth and i asked him a question about you know using progressive and direct attack and how do you apply that with uh, covering distance and but he le but he could learn that on, he could learn that online too uh, you, know I mean? you know what? I'm online a lot. I have never seen. Okay. I have never seen. I've never seen really good explanations of distance, timing, and rhythm, uh, five ways of attack on any YouTube video. On any, I've never. I've never seen. Even I've from never other seen legitimate, it. legitimate JKD guys online, I've never seen it. Point. Oh. Send me the videos. I'll, um, I want to hear. No, no. Yeah, no. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I've, uh, you know what? I've actually saw one guy give give a demonstration of something, and I said, and I said, wow, that's the best. That's the best example of Jeet Kune Do I've ever seen from a YouTube video, oh, ever. Wow. Wow. And I sent it to all my students. And the guy well, wasn't. You send it to me. The guy wasn't doing martial arts. Oh, he wasn't. Oh. No, he was doing something else. And, <laughs> and I sent and I, the video if you and I sent it to all it. my students and they all literally one of them, the best was one of my guys. He sent me a message back on Facebook. He's like, uh, write that dude and tell him to take that shit down because we don't want other people knowing that. Oh, all right. It yeah. was like literally like, you know, it was the best example of Chicken Do I've ever seen. And it wasn't a martial arts video, but I've actually never seen really good, really good. Um, I mean, it may exist. Who knows? Sure. I, I've right. never seen, I mean, listen, you you see, there's, there's plenty of video online of like Ted Wong, who's freaking phenomenal at Jeet Kune Do, right? Probably one of the best examples of Jeet Kune Do ever out there. Ted Wong, there's, there's hour-long talks of him. There's videos of him doing all sorts of awesome footwork. But if you look at his footwork and say, okay, there's step and slide, slide, step. You, you know, shuffle, step, whatever you want to call them. All of that are real. Okay, and I'm going to impersonate all of that. That's mm -hmm. absolutely nothing to do with Chi Kune Do. And yes, Ted Wong's doing it. Why? Because it's, in the video, Ted Wong's not, not explaining to you why he's doing each thing that he's doing. Huh. If, you know, so yeah, you can learn Ted Wong's, you know, step and slide, and then his slide step. But and you could you could now mimic say mimic the way Ted Wong is moving around, but it's not the way that Ted Wong's moving around that makes that Jeet Kune Do. People confuse the method with the methodology. They're confusing the idea that oh, if I am, if I can move around and let, and move around in a way say Ted Wong moves around, who is just it's just poetry in motion, that I'm doing mm -hmm. Jeet Kune Do. If you don't know why. Ted Wong was doing what he was doing. What was the impetus behind it? Right. How, how was he using that footwork to grasp control and have a proactive effect on the movement in a fight as opposed to a reactive effect in, on, mm -hmm. on, in the fight? Ted Wong was using that footwork to gain control of a situation in a way that was on a level that you're never going to see on a YouTube video, even if you have hours upon hours of watching Ted Wong on video. Mm -hmm. You have to literally watch his feet and watch what the other guy is doing to try and maybe possibly come to some understanding and grasp as to what is going on that will give you Jeet Kune Do. Knowing step and slide, slide step, and kicks. By the way, Taekwondo kicks are not like Jeet Kune Do kicks at all. Um, so like that's to even come to, even well, see, but that's, the, that's the thing though. I mean, you know, this is part of the problem and that is the, the JKD is not as defined as, 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 um, as I would like to, as I would have liked it to be. It's not standardized. It's, it is, you know, if, if you learn from the Chinatown school, you're going to do things 
similar to the Oakland school, but not exactly, not right. exactly. Sure. You know, if you, you know, if you, and they both are going to be JKD and I, and I'm not going to delegitimize any, either one of them. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. From Ted, Ted Wong and he certified you in JKD and says, you're a JKD guy. I'm not going to go, well, you don't do it like Steve Gold. So therefore you're not JKD. We can't, you know, that's, that's the, that's part of the, an extra problem in this whole, in this right. whole conversation. You know what I mean? So right, no, um, I agree. But like, again, like, but, I, I, you're hundred percent right. But even like one of the problems also is like, like, like we had said earlier, like, Oh, if you're doing Taekwondo kicks and Wing Chun trapping and uh -huh. you know, boxing hands, whatever the hell, like people don't realize in, in Jeet Kune Do, in real life, G, G, real, you know, real Jeet Kune Do, the physical the physical tools of Jeet Kune Do are nothing like a Taekwondo kick. A Taekwondo, mm -hmm. the Taekwondo kick, most Japanese Jiu Jitsu kicks, involve a chamber right mm -hmm. you lift the leg up you chamber your leg you yeah. throw the kick you rechamber you put down there's this right. process in mm -hmm. Jeet Kune Do the tool travels in a straight line from the floor to the target mm -hmm. so the the chamber only happens a little bit yeah you know yeah. that the power comes from the from rotational force mm -hmm. And from you know momentum, right, it doesn't right. come from that snap of a chamber kick. Yeah. And you try and explain this to people like, yo, but you know, I have a third degree black belt in Taekwondo, so I want to kick this way. So kick that way. I don't care. But if you want to talk about a Jeet Kune Do kick, there's a methodology involved. There's right, a right. reason. There's a reason you're in right lead. There's, there's yeah, the and right, and, and and this is part of the hairball that came to me as far as JKD was concerned because. Like you always have to ferret out because I'm sure that you teach things that are unique to Sean. You know sure. what I mean? To your students. You're like, this is part of, yeah, I learned this curriculum and I learned this way of doing things. And then in that, with that was my, was, was something that I added too that I thought was valuable that I passed on. And, and so, so the thing is, is like part of me is, is like, well, I don't know because my instructor in JKD, Troy Molden, uh, was also a Taekwondo guy. So he might not have thought my kicks needed correcting. Right. You know what I mean? Sure. I don't know. So it's just like one of those things, well, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, and the other thing is, is too, is like when he taught me JKD, there was very little of these are Taekwondo kicks. This is Wing Chun. This is this. There was some of that, but it was really kind of presented to me as, as, as a unit. Right. You know what I mean? Of course, right. it, it wasn't really presented as like, okay, today we're going to practice Taekwondo kicks. Right. And now sure. we're going to practice Wing Chun trapping. And now we're going to practice some distance management from boxing. It wasn't presented to me that way. Mm -hmm. it, it was, it was presented to me as this is JKD. And, and today we're going to do, you know, we're going to stand and do, um, you know, double trapping. And, you know, now we're going to do double trapping when the person comes at you with a jab. And now we're going to do double trapping when the person comes at you with a jab cross. And, and, and now you're going to, um, you're, you're going to step to the side and throw a side kick and then come in with the back fist on this, this time, you know, we would take an element and we would just practice that element over and over again. It wasn't, it wasn't like today we're doing Wing Chun, you know, it wasn't, right. it, it, it wasn't that it was presented to me as like this whole unit. It was like, okay, today we're going to deal with kicking range. Today we're going to deal with trapping range. Today we're going to deal with, you know, it was just, it was just today we're going to deal with, with speed. You know, today we're going to deal with the person throws a sidekick at you and you just barely get it out of the way, slap it down and come back with your own sidekick on his leg. That was, you know, and you just we would just practice that like for an hour you know somebody right. throwing a sidekick and you boom back down on the side boom back down no one said okay we're going to deal with boxing but we're going to use like like kickboxing it just it wasn't brought up that way anyway good. No, no, <laughs> sorry understand. i didn't mean that. no i understand what you're saying and i it, and 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 that's how most schools are you know um well that's the thing too and and, and yeah Sorry, go oh, ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, brother. 
I was just going to say this whole idea of taking a piece of this, a piece of this, a piece of this, and making it JKD in, in a way is foreign because that was kind of already done. It was already handed to you and it was already right. handed to me as a package. Right. So like literally the other day on Facebook, yesterday on Facebook, I, uh, I, I did something I never do. I, I really gave some guy a hard time and I, and I, and I hate to do that because I, I, I really never do that. But he posted something factually inaccurate about Bruce Lee. And again, I'm not the Bruce Lee police. I normally don't give a shit. But he posted that, you know, um, someone, uh, something effective like, oh, well, Bruce Lee never went past yellow belt in, in a martial art. That he just <laughs> absorbed. It. And I'm like, you know what? That was the biggest load of bullshit I ever read on Facebook. And why did it annoy me? It annoyed me for two reasons. Mostly one, because I had a bad commute home. <laughs> okay. That was, that was why I was annoyed me It was three hours in Manhattan traffic. Oh, but, wow. Oh, it was like I was ready to put a bullet through my head um, in the most, <laughs> most cheek and old fashion I possibly could. But the, what really annoyed me was it was clearly something he used to justify himself dropping out of different martial arts schools because he got bored, as this is what Bruce Lee did. And he was trying to get other people to feel like, you know what, let me quit after four months and move on to a different martial art because that's what Bruce Lee did. And nothing can be further from the truth, okay? Bruce Lee had one instructor, one school that he stayed in for a few years, and then after that basically worked on his own. Yes, he had friends with this guy and friends with that guy and would play here and play there, but he didn't join – uh, Ed Parker's school and to get the yellow belt and leave that and then go to some other school and train. That's just complete utter nonsense. And, right. and, and this idea that of just hopping from art to art is it's just, it's just bullshit. It's not how you're going to learn Jeet Kune Do. How are right, you going right. to learn Jeet Kune Do? Learn, train with somebody that knows how to do Jeet Kune Do. Right, right. You know, train with if, somebody that knows how to teach it. If, and then, if, and then go do what you want to do. Right, right. If you don't have that that option, so like I like I lived. I came from a small, you know, pretty small town, sure. and I didn't have that option. Believe me, I, I would have if I could have. Um, do, you, but I, I, what I did was I took advantage of what was here, and I did have, and right. we did have some great talent. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did have some great talent. My teacher left, and her own Heim, Heimberger moved into town. And he he had great talent. And then at the at, almost at the same time, Ron Heimberg moved into town. Another guy who was certified under Paul Zunak moved into town. Cool. And I kind of that was like a choice that I had to make. Like I was just like, hey, sure. Am I going to go into Wing Chun kind of deeper, or I'm going to switch over to this Paul Zunak school? And at the time, I just kind of chose. You know what? I'd like to just travel along this Wing Chun path for a little while. But for a lot of people who don't have that. Um, that option, uh, what what would you suggest? What, what would you suggest? I would say to them, what do they love? Yeah. What do they feel comfortable with? And what, what do they desire to do? Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, if your goal is to say, I eventually want to be in Jeet Kune Do, mm -hmm. then I would look to be the, in a boxing gym, a Wing Chun school, or some fencing school. Mm -hmm. Um, most universities have some sort of fencing program. A lot of high schools have fencing programs. If that's their goal, if their goal is to say, I just want to be an effective martial artist, I don't care what you call it, then mm -hmm. I would I would go either boxing or Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You know, it's you want to – I feel the sports are trained right. better than the traditional martial arts. Now – if your goal is to say, hey, I want to do Kung Fu, I don't care what, you know, I want to do Kung Fu. I don't care about is it the most effective or is it then find a Kung Fu. You have to go. My, my biggest advice I could possibly give to somebody is you have to go find a place that you want to go to after working all day mm -hmm. that you feel comfortable and happy doing. Eventually, it all works out. Go do white eyebrow kung fu because the kung fu teacher there is awesome. He's a nice guy. 
He treats his students with respect. He's a mm-hmm. He, he, everybody who go there seems happy, and after lifting up garbage cans for the last eight hours, you actually want to go into that environment. Or there right. could be the Jeet Kune Do school that's down the block from you, run by Sifu Douchebag, and he's got, you know, douchebags full of the place. Who knows? Right, right. And after working all day, do you want to go hang out with Sifu Douchebag? No, you don't. Because right. you're not, so you're not going to want to. So the biggest advice I can give to anybody is go find a place you'd want to spend some time in. Don't yeah. worry about Jeet Kune Do. Worry about being right. happy. That's the most important thing in life. Be happy. Right. And you know what? If you want to learn Jeet Kune Do, go train in white eyebrow. Right. And every once in a while, go fly out to somebody and, and, and learn Jeet Kune Do privately or something. But go train. Right. And I don't, I know that's probably not the answer you wanted. I know you're asking. No. I no, really no, no. believe that's, that the, the real answer is go train in what makes you happy. I right, do Wing right. Chun with, with, with my seafood because it makes me happy. I live in New York City. There's mm-hmm. literally a Wing Chun school every other freaking block, okay? I, I can train in anything. I live in New York City. I can do anything. You know, mm-hmm. literally, I can buy anything in, his, in this city. Not that I can afford it, but literally, at least it's available to me. Right. You can buy a tiger, right? Right, you, you can do anything. In New York City, you can do anything. Trust me, with 50 bucks in a dream, you can fulfill any goal. It's just, you know. Right. So you can do it. And I do what I do because it makes me happy. Right. You know, um, I don't care if you live in some small town in Montana or if you live in Los Angeles or in New York City or wherever the hell you are. But – you just you have right. to do what makes you happy, and right, right. And, and that's to be everybody's goal in life. But you know what? If, if if for nothing else, go find a wrestling program, go find a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school, go find a boxing gym. If there's not a Jeet Kune Do school available to you, there's not a Wing Chun school. Of course, the default would be Wing Chun, in my opinion. If you mm-hmm. can find a Wing Chun school that you feel comfortable with, I would say go Wing Chun. That's okay. in my opinion. Because although it may not, quote, unquote, look like modern Jeet Kune Do in a lot of ways, you'll learn a lot of the principles, a lot of the concepts, and um, it, it'll, it'll lead you to further Wing Chun. I would say, you know, Wing Chun, the three majors, right? Wing Chun, boxing, and fencing are the three major influences on Jun Fan, on Lee mm-hmm. Jun Fan, right? So I would say I would do that. But that aside, I would say – Go, go, where, go where you're happy. That's the most right. important thing in life. And choose a school. Steer away. Choose, right. a choose a school. school. Choose a place Not you want to. Right. Right, exactly. People say, well, why did you pick? People say to me, Sean, why do you do more yacht lineage instead of Wong Shun Lung lineage when clearly Wong Shun Lung was the better fighter? And I'm like, because my seafood does more yacht lineage. Hmm. I and chose like, school and a teacher. They're like, style. they're like, oh, but there's, there's Wong Chun Lung School right there in New York, and I'm like, yeah, I know. I, you know, I don't work too far from it, but my Sifu does because I want to be with my Sifu. Mm-hmm. I want he makes me happy. The mm-hmm. crotchety old bastard. I love him, but and I call him old because he's about an hour older than me. But <laughs> it's it's just you know. Yeah. You know it, I, 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 I'm with my seafood because that's what makes me happy. Right, you right. You have to go with what makes you happy. Right. Well, cool. I don't think we're going to have the time to get to our, our other, uh, our other uh, topic today. Okay, uh, I had some the, good stuff loaded up about that. All right. <laughs> oh, did, oh, did, I, don't mind, I don't mind staying on if you don't, but I, I don't want to take your time. Or, I mean, I'm oh, good okay. if you want to talk about it. Sure. If you're good, let's go for it. Yeah. Let's go for it. Okay. So sure. I, I was just not sure, you know, what kind of time frame you're dealing with, but I could go I could go an extra twenty minutes, half hour if you got Sound, it. Sounds good to me, bro. Okay, so we beat that dead horse into oblivion. <laughs> I think I think I, I like what you said that that you know, we start a conversation, we can't um, we there's not necessarily a resolve. There's just furthering the conversation. Right. Uh, and I and I think that I, I hope that what we talked about does that for people. Um, so the Bruce Lee 
video that's floating around right now that says the 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 only fight ever recorded by Bruce Lee. You know, right. what do you think? All right, what so a few things. One, I know for some reason it's like really making the rounds on Facebook and everything. I've had this video for years now. Yeah. I mean, it's it's old. I mean, everybody in Jeet Kune Do has had this video for 20 years. So I don't know why all of a sudden it's become super popular. Uh, I got I got a copy of it on a VHS tape from Lamar Davis. I mean, without exaggerating, I bet it's 20 years ago. Lamar Davis mailed me a uh, a copy of this videotape. You know, it's it's just right. been around forever. Um, although this is a pretty clear copy of it, but it, it's it's been around forever. So. If, there's so much bullshit on Facebook about this video. Okay, so my, some of my favorites. I saw one one website, uh, one Facebook page, post it, and they said that, um, and they say this as if it's fact. I just, I just, they just dream shit up that it was um, Bruce Lee's first MMA fight, and that <sighs> um, Bruce Lee wanted to do bare knuckle. But the people that ran the uh, the fight insisted that he used gear and protection, and he got so angry, and that's why he beat the guy down the way he did. And but he and he wanted it to be a bare knuckle fight. Man, that's just such bullshit. It's amazing. Yeah. Nothing could be further from the truth. First of all, so the video that everybody's out there is two videos. There's one that's like about a minute forty. And there's one that's about eight or nine minutes long, right? Yeah. So right. the one that's like eight or nine minutes long is actually Bruce Lee with three different of three of his three different of his students, right? There's uh, Bruce Lee with Dan and Asanto. There's Bruce Lee with um, James Lee, and then there's Bruce Lee doing um, Chi Sao with uh, with Taki Kimura. Right. Yeah. And um, the, how you can tell the difference between Inosanto and and and, and uh, James Lee is uh, when you see Bruce Lee sparring with the guy in the black vest, that's uh, that's Inosanto, and the guy who's wearing the white vest is James Lee. Okay. This was the 1967 Parker uh, Long Beach Invitational, which, by the way, nothing like the movie Dreg in the Bruce Lee story, although that what? supposedly happened at that. It's just you know. This was a demo that Bruce Lee put on about protective equipment. It was Bruce Lee. Uh -huh. this, this was the whole idea. He was sparring a couple of his students to show something that was unheard of at the time, that you can train in martial arts full contact safely. Oh. There, was this, there was this stupid misconception back in the 60s that if you trained – you couldn't. You, you can only do point, uh, point sparring because if you did full contact, you'd kill each other with these death touches and all this other bullshit that, that wasn't real. And what Bruce Lee was showing that, no, if we want to get better as fighters, look, we wear these baseball shin guards and these headgear and these gloves, and, and we, we go out there and we spar, and it's safe, and we're getting better at fighting. And that's what the whole – of course, I don't even want to get students, right? So right. that's what this was about. It was not some sort of MMA fight. It was it was him with his students putting on a demonstration, you know? It's, right. Well, that's clickbait, clearly. And, you know, right. Bruce Lee's first MMA fight. That's just, you know, <laughs> I got to see that, right? right? Or Bruce Lee's only fight caught on tape, you know, or right. whatever. That's, it's just such it worked, it worked on me. It worked on right. me. I, <laughs> No, I, I, I clicked it. But what was surprising is, is that it was a video that I had seen before. Right. And I was just like, what's, you know, why is this around? Now, I didn't have the VHS copy as, as you had, but as long as the internet's been up and running and YouTube's been on or other sites, I remember old sites that used to have video clips, I've seen that video. You know, it's right. just like, why, are, why is this suddenly getting getting popularity? I think it's just a bunch of a click clickbaits, but... Um, part of the controversy has been uh, that I've heard anyway from people is that Bruce Lee doesn't move like JKD is taught. If you see it, it he's clearly not moving the way it's taught. So obviously, you see him kind of he's not using the bai jump. He's kind of just standing there with his arm out, 
Yeah. And he's having his student attack him, and he's just counterattacking in most of the cases. Yeah, I, I yeah. agree with that. He's he, he, There are some nuggets there, though. There are some okay. really good nuggets there. Um, I love the way – first of all, that, whoever – Brought that up is is spot on right. That, that that Bruce Lee is not moving the way Bruce Lee moved. He's <clears throat> he's he's not you know it's not a JKD fight. It's a demonstration of training equipment. That's really what it's about. But um, that he's, that puts a whole new spin on it too. You know he's sparring with a couple of his students to show hey look we punch each other and everybody's safe. Mm-hmm. That's really that's really what it's about, you know. But there are a few nuggets there that I, you know, I so I watched it just because you had mentioned mentioned it to me that we were going to be chatting about this. I saw. Let me Google it and watch it. And one one or two things really popped out at me. The way he was dealing and capitalizing on some of his. Um, his students' habits were just – it's just some brilliant stuff going on there. The way he finds angles and um, openings and just the simplest of movements and this 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 drawing that he has, uh, I, I would have been amazing just to know him for five minutes because you could see the way he's drawing them out with just the slightest shift of his hips. Mm-hmm. And and he could see them coming. And, and just this, this way he just – takes this cute little angle and just gets the opening pop right to the head. Right. And it's just, it's, it, it's, if you want to understand where he was going with stuff, man, look at, look at the way he deals with things a second or two right before an attack. Mm-hmm. It, and it's not, it's not, see, that's, that's, that's the cool part about Bruce Lee and Jeet Kune If you want to really get a grasp and an understanding of Jeet Kune don't worry so much about what Bruce Lee does after, after his attack is launched. Look at what Bruce Lee's doing two seconds before his attack is launched. Which right. is usually like, what, what is drawing the initial attack from, the, from the, his opponent that Bruce Lee is capitalizing upon? If you notice, almost never throughout the, the whole tape does Bruce Lee initiate the exchange. Right, yeah. Right. It's almost all counterfighting. And that may have been just pre-programmed before. And I guys, listen, we're going to get up there. We're going to move around for three or four minutes. Um, you attack me, I'm just going to do some counterfighting. You know, that, you know, they're friends. I mean, it was Guru Dan and Bruce Lee. They're friends for years at this point. But Bruce Lee, in the, if you look at those videos, if you watch what he's doing literally seconds before each fight, before each exchange, that will open your eyes to real distance timing and control and it's that I just thought it was brilliant. I, I was actually very impressed with that. Hmm. Well the uh the criticism is at this point that well now that we've got this tape, oh, right. Yeah, we've had it for like since it's been out. But you know, it's just like um this is the way Bruce Lee really fought and all you guys are doing it so wrong. Awesome. I hope, I hope, you know what? I hope everybody does. That. <laughs> every, everybody's going to stand there on their two legs, not balanced with their one arm out. Great. I'll be yeah. making you punch them in the face. That's the true Jeet Kune Do right there. Right. right. You know, it's like, that, it's, like people, people that buy, it's like people that buy a Tao Jeet Kune Do and follow it. You know what I mean? It's as if right. it's Bruce Lee's book. You know, and then people want to look at this video and say, oh, well, this is how Bruce Lee really fought. If they're dumb enough to do that, I, I feel bad for them. But, you know, they probably have to have Velcro on their shoes instead of laces. It's just, you know, that's, that's, that's just the truth, you know. It's like if, if, right. if you think how Bruce Lee spar- – just think about it. If you were going to spar one of your students because you're yeah. trying to show this audience how this new awesome headgear is uh-huh. – and if people can't look at that and say, oh, well, this is how he obviously Ian would fight in the street. You know right. what I mean? The way he's right. able, he spars one of his students. Right. A moron. You know, it's like, right. it's, it's just silliness. But um, the, one of the cool things about that is actually my teacher was there. Oh, Steve, really? Yeah, Steve Golden was at that. Oh, well, um, that's cool. Yeah, so because at the time, this was 1967, um, Steve was a black belt under Ed Parker. 
Yeah, right. So, I remember I remember right, him so saying the, that on your podcast the that Long he was Beach, a black the Long Beach Invitationals were um, tournaments cre created by Ed Parker. And of course right. all his students would go and and uh and and and, and help out Ed Parker with right. the, the thing. So uh my my teacher's there at the uh mm -hmm. at, at, and witnessed this demonstration. I mean, he had met Bruce Lee before that, so you know. But um, I still think it's kind of cool that, like, when I watch the video, in my mind, like one of those guys right there in the audience is Steve Golden. You know what I mean? Which is right. That's really kind cool. Of cool. You know, it's uh, it's a pretty cool thing. But you know, you can learn from anything if you have a basis of what to, what to look for. You know, um, and if you understand what you're looking for. Sure, you can learn from that from that video a little bit and see what Bruce Lee's doing. Look at what Guru Dan and James Lee are doing. They're obviously doing what Bruce Lee taught them to do. They're just doing it on a, on a level lower than what Bruce Lee was doing. But um, that, I think there is probably the, the, the bigger lessons for most people. But look at what Guru Dan is doing. Look what James Lee is doing. And, and look how Bruce Lee is dealing with those attacks. You know, right. that's... Um, I really like the actually uh, the video of Lee doing uh, Chisao with Taki Kimura. and yeah. it's also a nice little like um, screenshot of history of Jeet Kune Do. When you look at, you know, those are the the, the big three as far as um, teaching for Bruce Lee, right? You had uh, Dennis Santo ran the LA Chinatown School, James Lee ran the Oakland School, and Taki Kimura ran the uh, Seattle School. And um, there they are, all three of them, either sparring or doing chi sao with, with Bruce Lee in that eight-minute video. And that's, that's kind of cool. I mean, even if it's not a, a great representation of what they were doing, it's still kind of cool to watch, you know? I mean... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's cool. It's cool to watch. I mean, I watched it, you know? It's just like I see, I had seen it before. Sure. I don't know why. I, that's the big thing is I didn't know why it was making the rounds. It's like, I, I know I've seen this, you know? It's like, oh, well. So if, if you really want to, if people listening to this podcast really want to have some fun with it, look at the way Lee, Lee's body moves after he launches the attack also. Like, so like he'll launch the attack and then change angles as he, as the attack is being launched. And I'll have to look at that again and see that. You know, that's it's sure. kind of sweet. You know, it doesn't do it every time, but you'll see him. It's almost as if the momentum of the attack helps him change the angles. Mm -hmm. Almost as if, you know, that was planned on, and it's it's, it's, it's <laughs> as if he'd done it before. You know, things like that are really important. And um, well, the thing is, is, is you never take a demonstration and then and then start saying things like people are saying. You know, it just it just amazes me. I don't care how good the demonstration is. I can do a demonstration, and that's not going to be even if it's a sparring match. That's not going to be exactly the way I fight. Right. You know, it's it, that it's going to it's going to be different. I've got I've got a uh, a sparring match with a guy uh, named Justin Horsley, who's done full contact MMA. I put it up on my side. I said, look, you know, this is me sparring. And it's pretty intense. You know, I mean, it's not like MMA full contact, but it's just a sparring thing that we were doing. Um, but that's not the way I I would fight if somebody approached me at my car or something like that. Right. That's sure. Not, right. Exactly. I mean, it would be similar, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. they're definitely parallels, but no one should look at that and go, Oh, that's the way Ian fights. Cause I saw him fight, uh, this MMA fighter, uh, you know, helping that guy out for his, for his right. fight, you know? So it's just like, no, that was just a sparring match. I'm not even sure he would fight that way. You right. Know, sure. Right. If you approached him, I know, I, I know that if if somebody approached me at my car, I would close the distance immediately. There'd be no bouncing around. I'd close the distance immediately. I would either be going for an eye jab or a throat jab, and I'd be going for a groin shot or a straight blast. Right. That's it. That's it's. I'm not going to mess around. If I had to take him to the ground, maybe. You know, I have a couple backup systems. So no one can look at that fight and then say that, oh, that's that's how – that guy really moves. It may be similar there. You could draw parallels, but it wouldn't, there's just no way, you know, that that's going to be what a, a true representation of, of what I do. You know, I remember 
and I train MMA, you know, and I train all kinds of stuff. But, you know, right now I'm at this MMA school. I'm going, you know, uh, deep into jujitsu. But I, I, I still train the stand-up stuff, too, just to keep myself sharp. Um, and, and I love it. I, I love it. And I love MMA. Legit art. Don't have any problem with that. I've talked about this before. Um, but I've been in, you know, not too many real fights. But I've been in a couple, like, not real fights, but, you know, like street mm -hmm. fights. None of them look like MMA. Right. You know what I mean? I, I one guy, I, I, I just I pushed him into a corner of a room, and I it shouldn't have done it. I, I hate thinking about it because I've said no to more fights than I can count. I, I really, you know, no, I don't want to fight. You know, whatever. But this guy just got on my nerves, and I was having a bad day, and he was saying some shit. And instead of walking away, I decided to do something about it, and I shoved him into a corner next to a book a bookshelf in his bed, and I just started hitting him it didn't look anything like anything, you know, it, I didn't like do any cool thanks or you know, come up with a back fist. And a, it, it didn't look anything like that fight. And to say that, well, now we know what Bruce Lee really looked like when he fought is ridiculous to me. Right. That's it's just absolutely ridiculous. ridiculous. This, is, this is nothing to do with that. That video had nothing to do with Chi Kune Do. That video had to do with, Hey guys, look, we can spar without hurting each other. If we wear equipment, right. Yeah, we can do full contact sparring. And that that's what's going to take martial arts to the next level, not right. this point sparring you guys are doing. There was this belief back in the 60s that you couldn't do anything more than point sparring because people would die. Oh, it was, that, that it was, was, it was that ridiculous. Was, yeah, that was a belief that I had heard from my – Of course, you know, yeah. I was just and, like, oh, yeah, well, that's the reason why they don't have that. We only do point sparring because you'll kill somebody, man. Right. Yo, and, that's, so, and Lee was showing, hey, no, you know what? That's a bunch of hogwash. We yeah. could we could put this equipment on, and we can go pretty damn hard, and right, we can right. we can we can train and get much better at what we're doing. Yeah. And this is how we do it at my place. That's what he's showing. Like this is how we do it at my place. He wasn't showing strategies. He wasn't trying to say, "Hey, this is Jeet Kune Do at its finest." He's saying, "Hey, look, I'm wearing this equipment. Look how we can spar." Yeah. So that's mm. the, that. That's what that whole demo was about. Right, you know, right. Anything, anything more than that is just a whole bunch of bullshit. And, but listen, whenever the Bruce Lee's involved, there's bullshit involved, right? There's, <laughs> there's the one dude who there's actually video of Bruce Lee owning his ass, but no, he says that it was, you know, uh, it was cut. It was, it was cut. cut yeah. And yeah, yeah. You know, give me a break. Every video was cut, right, Jack? Yeah, sure, I'm sure. You yeah. know, and then there's the uh, there's one guy I know of. I never met him. Who you know swears that he's you know he kicked Bruce Lee in the head and yeah everybody kicked Bruce Lee in the head after he died you know it's like whenever Bruce Lee's involved with anything it's just bullshit yeah. gets piled on you know it's just it's uh, like it's like being the quick draw of the West you know right. what I mean the fastest gun in the West everybody just wants a piece of you and right. it's easier to own a piece of you after right after you can't shoot death. back right <laughs> When, yeah, yeah so after true. you're gone, then everybody could say, "Oh, yeah, well, you know, I was showing him something. He he was really interested in what I was doing, you know, or whatever." Right. Or, uh, yeah. yeah. It's all a bunch of bullshit. But, uh, <laughs> all right. But, all righty, folks. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Sean, for being on the program. Hang hang with me for just a second. I'll talk to you afterwards. Uh, if you like what you heard, you know what to do. You share this on your favorite social media, and you write a review in iTunes. Uh, this is actually going to be our 25th episode of, um, of the Empty Cup podcast. So that's pretty cool. That's quite a marker. Uh, and it's going well. But honestly, I would love to see me, uh, I would love to see this program get on new and noteworthy. So please write a review in iTunes or Stitcher Radio or wherever you heard this. Share this on your favorite social media. You're always welcome to follow us at Facebook for slash the Empty Cup podcast on Twitter at Empty Cup Podcast. And if you want to see me in action kicking some ass, go to Ronan JKB on YouTube and uh, you'll see my training tips and my vlog thoughts and all that kind of stuff. And a uh, special thank you again to my guest, Sean Madigan, for gracing us with his presence. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Anytime, brother. And until we meet again, keep your gloves up. <laughs>